Greetings and welcome to my second mini lecture on Machiavelli. And I want to turn the discussion a little bit away from kind of macro concepts. In the last mini lecture, I talked about Machiavelli's uh, political environment in which he lived. He lived in a city state. It was a city state that was attacked by a nation state and was left vulnerable. So obviously part of the prince is a call to wake up unify the Italian states so that they can be a great power like the French, like the Spaniards, and like the English. Uh, he is seen as a modern political theorist because he's trying to get rid of religion uh, as a focal point. In fact, I told you last time that religion in the church makes men humble, weakens their ability to lead. Uh, he's primarily interested in order and power and strength to try to promote stability and freedom from foreign control. And I gave you some concepts that are significant with Machiavelli, really the first recognizing the potential of the nation state, the fact that people are selfish and it's a tool to build a stable and free nation state, that political considerations should be supreme, not morality, religion, or ethics, as the ancients would have you believe. He is an empirical. He says, look at what is, don't look at what should be. He rejects those ancient uh, motives. So, uh, and uh, I concluded the lecture by talking about how many consider Machiavelli the first modern realist. There certainly were realists uh, in the ancient world, like Thucydides, I mentioned him, the guy who chronicled the Peloponnesian War. But let me get back into Machiavelli and his assumptions about human nature, because uh, many people who criticize Machiavelli attack him on his assumptions. And when you're looking at political theory, uh, I think that is the place to start. So your book says Machiavelli believes that people are wicked and dishonest. Since people are wicked, a ruler needs to learn how not to be good in order to hold power. And Machiavelli says maybe you can hold on to power uh, and, and still be a good guy. And if, that, if you can do that, that's wonderful. But he says that holding power is essential, even if that means engaging in immoral or amoral behavior, being inhumane, being uncharitable, breaking your word. And of course, seeming to be religious, but not actually doing so. In fact, he goes so far as to say, it's okay if you even murder or steal in order to hold on to power. Now, Machiavelli might respond by saying that that's an extreme characterization of myself. Uh, in one passage, for example, Machiavelli says that people have selfish motives. It doesn't make them bad or evil, but it's their natural condition. And it is only by recognizing the extreme selfishness of human beings that you will get a correct awareness of reality. It is only through understanding that private morality cannot be applied in public affairs that you can create a stable government that will last. Your book goes on to talk about a ruler who seeks to have a reputation for generosity, will waste his resources, he'll become uh, hateful to his subjects because he'll impose taxes on them. And in essence, he says that if you are a ruler, generosity is a mistake. So my obvious question, and I didn't write this in the notes, and you may want to write it in the sidelights because I actually think it would make a good exam question. If Machiavelli were asked, what is the single most important strength for a leader? His answer would be his reputation. And in the world of international relations, which is my specialty, reputation in the world of international relations is called credibility. Does a leader have credibility? Does a nation have credibility? Will it do what it says that it will do? So in the personal realm, a leader needs reputation. 
And in the international world, a nation needs credibility. So they're different words, but essentially they are the same thing. Now, there's an interesting statement in your book. And certainly there are great people who have disagreed on this next statement. But in your textbook, it says that Machiavelli says that one ought to be loved in feared, but it is safer to be feared than loved. Well, some would say that that's not true. I'll come back to it uh, in just a little bit. Now, if you take a look at the heart of Machiavelli, right, the ancient Greeks, what was the good life? It was virtue. It was the striving for human perfection. It was justice, seeking the public interest. What makes Machiavelli a modern political theory is the good life for Machiavelli is power, which he defines as controlling the masses. But he really never tells us why power is worth pursuing. So in your notes, in your notes, I compared Machiavelli to the New Testament of the Bible, Matthew 16, 26. And I'll just read it to you. What good will it be if, for a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? If you want it in more common sense terms, what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Certainly, I summarize the break with Machiavelli in the ancients here, right? Where uh, the ancients stressed a normative approach. They were interested in ethics and how we ought to behave. And Machiavelli's stress is empirical. How do men have to behave in order to live in modern society and your textbook doesn't say this but when i looked at machiavelli and when i read the prince and when i read the discourses it seems like there are three basic precepts to human nature in the machiavellian world first that there is a desire to acquire possessions and that it is natural we're going to talk a little bit about that with Locke, the cornerstone of Locke's political theory, the reason why John Locke claims that people form civil society and leave the state of nature is because of this desire to acquire private property. So Machiavelli introduces this long before John Locke, but uh, this desire to acquire possessions and private possessions, that it's natural, is not something that only Machiavelli claims, but many, many political theorists claim. The second is that human beings are selfish animals. It's not necessarily evil or bad, as I mentioned earlier, uh, which completely rejects the ancient and medieval ideas. Remember I told you that in the ancient Greek world, the assumption of the ancient Greeks was that we're communal animals that we need one another, uh, that we needed political activity to become hu fully human, and that you could form a, a common community in society. And Hobbes, uh, Hobbes, and Machiavelli rejects that. Machiavelli does not agree that we're, to use Karl Marx's phrase, spe species beings. Uh, Machiavelli says that we're not community oriented, we're selfishly oriented, and we'll pursue our selfish interest over the public interest every single time. So certainly the precepts of human nature, the desire to acquire possessions is natural, that humans are selfish animals, and that people are not community oriented, runs contrary to the ancient Greeks who we're interested in ethics and how we ought to believe. 
Machiavelli also rejects the ancients by asserting that power rather than justice is the most important variable in understanding politics. And here he is talking about both domestic politics as well as international relations. Leaders must be logical and they must employ tactics to enhance their power. Morality and ethics will not increase power in any meaningful way. Now, many would say that Machiavelli is wrong here. That if indeed reputation is the key thing that a leader should have, it could be argued that if a leader is perceived as moral and ethical, that this may actually increase his reputation and credibility and allow him to make mistakes without being questioned if his reputation is good. And the fourth one I've already mentioned, and I think it is crucial, and that is that self-interest and power-seeking behavior, it's not sinful, it's not wicked, it is simply a factual reading of the human condition. It is simply human nature. And instead of judging self-interest and power seeking as a bad thing, you should just look at that as being natural. And, and, and sort of like our founding fathers in the Federalist Papers do later, right? Because the Federalists make the same claim that if you have a correct understanding of human behavior, you build a political system that works with human nature and not against it, you can build a very, very stable and long-lasting governmental system because if your assumptions are correct, right? And our founding fathers in some ways say, things that sound Machiavellian or Hobbesian. They, they sound like those of the political realists. Uh, people like James Madison and Alexander Hamilton and John Jay in the Federalist Papers, they say that people have a natural lust for domination. They have a tendency to vex and oppress one another. While that sounds sinister and horrific, Madison and Hamilton in particular say, we're just describing the human condition. It's natural. We cannot change who we are as human beings. The very best we can hope to achieve is to control the effects of that nature. So if people are the, these power-seeking creatures, we will build a political system that checks power with power and ambition with ambition. And of course, while our founding fathers do not look for the governmental type that someone like Thomas Hobbes or Niccolo Machiavelli would advocate, the assumptions of many of our founding fathers are a lot like Machiavelli and Hobbes, that we are power seeking, that we are self-interested, that we do seek domination over other people. And so basically our founding fathers make the argument for a balance of power. The legislative branch and the executive branch and the judicial branches would all check one another. Now the political realists in the world of international relations say the same thing. In the world of international relations, they say the world is anarchic, which means it's like a state of nature, that there is this competition for power and resources. Once again, you can't change behavior, but what you can do is create a political system in which you get a balance of power. And political realists will say that that's what happened in the world of international relations from 1648 to 1918, nations made a very conscious effort to create a balance of power in Europe. Hope you're enjoying these mini lectures. I will be back with the third one shortly. Have a wonderful evening.